Good afternoon, Annie, Kwe Kwe, Wache. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à la série de seminaires Parlons de la COVID-19. I'm Tammy Eager. I'm the Interim Vice President for Research at Laurentian University, and I have the pleasure of officially opening the Let's Talk About COVID-19 seminar series today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and further recognize that Laurentian University and Science North are located on the traditional lands of the Tikmishing and Anishinaabek and that the city of Greater Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nation. COVID-19 has prevented us from gathering physically in one location. However, I'm very pleased that we can still connect through technology. Aujourd'hui, c'est la première de notre série de séminaires. Nous avons collab avec Science North pour cet événement parce qu'ils sont les spécialistes de la convocation de la science à notre communauté. We kick off the Let's Talk About COVID-19 seminar series today with researchers from Laurentian University and a staff scientist, better known as Blue Coats, uh, from Science North. Uh, these individuals will share their knowledge about zoonotic diseases, and they'll be here to answer your questions that you might have about animal and animal welfare around COVID-19. It's time to get started. Amy Henson is a professional science communicator and staff scientist with Science North. She has been communicating science professionally for over 15 years. Amy's gonna to facilitate today's seminar and uh, she'll introduce our speakers and she'll also be here to answer your questions. Uh, so just keep those uh, going throughout the day and we look forward to uh, having a lively discussion. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Tammy, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we at Science North are super excited to be partnering with Laurentian University on this project of Let's Talk COVID. And we have a wonderful series that's coming up over the next five weeks, and we can't wait to share uh, some really amazing and interesting science with you uh, as the weeks progress. So welcome, everyone. And I am really excited to introduce two of our speakers today, both from Laurentian University. Our our first speaker today is Dr. Albrecht schulte hostada He is a Canada Research Chair in Applied Evolutionary Ecology, and he is a behavioral and evolutionary ecologist. So he's working at the interface of behavior, evolution, uh, ecological genetics, the life Applied history of organisms ecology, and their physiology. And, he, and his research really encompasses, encompasses a lot of different areas of conservation um, and including the effects of of domesticated populations on closely related wildlife species and their interactions. So it's a really great pleasure to have him here. He has uh, some really interesting perspectives about COVID-19 as a virus, its interactions with animal populations, and uh, we're very excited to have him. And secondly as well, we have Dr. Rod Up, who is the director of the Animal Care Facility at Laurentian University. And Rod is no stranger to Sudburyans. Um, Rod was uh, a He's a practicing doctor of veterinary medicine, and he owned a private veterinary clinic, um, the Walden Animal Hospital, from 1979 to 2015. But we've seen Rod a lot in the news because of his interaction with wildlife, and he, because he has been the founder and president of Wild at Heart, one of the main uh, wildlife rehab uh, centers that we've had here in, um, in Sudbury, who have done really wonderful work over the years of rehabilitating wildlife. Um, and so Rod, right now, um, since 2008, works as the university veterinarian and the Director of Animal Research here at Laurentian. So we're very excited to have these two gentlemen come on and we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and its interactions with animals and also its connectivity to how COVID-19 and animal welfare are also connected together. So I'm really excited to introduce both of them. So welcome Rod, welcome Albrecht, come on and we'll, we'll get started. Hi, Rod. Hi, Hi Albrecht. Amy. So just so everybody knows, it's good to see you guys. So just so everybody mm. knows, um, Rod and Albrecht um, will be taking questions today. So that is really great. You can put your questions into the comments and they will get fed into us and I'll make sure to ask them. So um, we'll go through them. So if you have any questions at any time, just type them into the comments and we'll get to them. And what I'm going to allow each of them to do is um, to give a uh, 
start sort of start their discussion off. So they have a few minutes to sort of give us some background, some ideas around COVID-19 and, and their information that they have. I know they've been busy doing a lot of background research and coming up with some of the brand new information that's coming out almost on the hour uh, because this is such an important topic uh, within our society today. And so, but if you have any questions, just type them into the comments and, uh, and through both Science North and the Wrenching University, those comments will reach me and uh, we'll be able to ask those questions as well. So Albrecht, I'm gonna give, get you to start us off and tell us a little bit about some of the interesting ideas around COVID. Where does it, where did it come from, its evolution, et cetera? Yeah, so I thought I'd first um, just basically describe what a virus is, because many of the listeners might not know. So the virus, a virus, is simply um, a, a strand of genetic material, whether it's DNA or an analog called RNA, uh, and it's surrounded by a bunch of proteins. And basically what it does is it docks with a, with a cell and it injects itself, the DNA or RNA, into the cell, and it, that's how it replicates itself. And so COVID-19, you'll, you'll know, um, you may recall like the sort of classic sort of um, spherical shape with those spikes. And those spikes then fit into a receptor on a cell. And um, that's where a lot of, you know, research related to bioinformatics and molecular genetics are trying to see, find a way to disrupt that. But the question, of course, is where does the virus come from? And so COVID-19 is a coronavirus, which is different from influenza, influenza viruses. Um, and it's a zoonotic disease. And um, so what that means is that it's, an, it's a disease, it's a virus that jumps from animals to humans. Um, and this happens often, um, but the key uh, evolutionary sort of transition is when it was able to jump from human to human. That's when we see like a major uh, concern about the pandemic and all this that we're dealing with now. Um, so in terms of COVID-19, uh, we know it originated in Wuhan, China. So it seems to have been derived from a bat. So that is that um, when they eventually published the sequence of the RNA that's associated with this virus, it is most closely related. It's most similar to a virus that came from a type of horseshoe bat that lives in China. Um, and they found this uh, because uh, you know, there's, there are people, there's a research lab in Wuhan that has been there collecting viruses from bats. And bats seem to harbor these coronaviruses that, that um, seem to be able to jump from, from bats, their host, to other mammalian hosts fairly easily, more easily than other viruses. So there is something inherent about the coronaviruses that allows them to jump from, from animals to humans. Um, so the thing is though, that we don't know if there was an intermediate host between the horseshoe bat and the virus that we see today that's sort of you know, causing this global pandemic. And so there's a lot of discussion about whether you know, um, there was a, a, uh, an intermediate host, like you may have heard of the pangolin, which is this strange sort of scaled sort of mammal. Um, some people argued that this, this was also um, a source for the virus, but that's, that's yet to be, that's um, not yet um, clear anyway. Um, so yeah, so, you know, um, the issues here are about, um, and I, I'll, you know, I think Rod's going to speak about this probably more broadly than I will, but the issue here is, you know, how do these viruses jump from animals to humans? In the case of, in Wuhan, you know, we have, um, you know, a lot of markets that have wildlife species that are kept in captivity, that are kept in close proximity to humans. And so, you know, this is a possibility for a transition, especially for respiratory illness, to jump easily from animal to, to human. Um, we know that like this, we call this spillover when viruses uh, move from animals to humans. And this kind of spillover can happen in any context in which um, animals and humans live in close proximity. So not just in Wuhan, China, but also, you know, there's all kinds of other contexts, you know, even like, you know, livestock, um, we, we have um, influenza viruses that jump from pigs, for example, to humans and so on. But in, in terms of the coronavirus, um, it's unclear right now what happened. It certainly wasn't because somebody ate a bat, right? This is like sort of this trope that seems to be all over social media, and that's not likely what happened. Um, the fact is that bats uh, live in farmhouses, you know, they often roost up in the, in the roof, um, in the eaves, and often we see, you know, evidence of, uh, you know, their, their fecal matter ends up somehow mixed up 
and these viruses can can move um, and they can sort of jump from from um, and, uh, the bat to another animal, which is then you know also um, comes into to contact with humans. Um, but the, the the genetics of the the genomics, I guess, and the bioinformatics associated with the virus are very interesting. They're, obviously, there's lots of new things that are coming out uh, in terms of trying to sort out the exact source. Um, but that's basically where we're at in terms of what we know about COVID-19. I have a quick question about that then. So yeah. what, what, what's the value of us determining the source? So if we discover, you know, an intermediary yeah. you know, source yeah. or the original source, what's the value to us to understand why that's like, why is that important? Well, I think it, it's, it speaks to our need to, to mitigate the risks associated with these zoonotic viruses, because this is not the, you know, it seems that this area in, in China and, and in Asia is, is a hotspot for the movement of these, of these um, viruses. So um, there's a, a research scientist who called uh, Peter Daszak, who runs something called the Equal Health Alliance. It's a nonprofit uh, research um, organization that's actually based in New York City, but they've been working in Wuhan, China, and other hotspots near there um, because there is a recognized... Um, risk associated with the coronaviruses that are being somehow evolving in that area of the world. Um, and in fact, there's, there was like a 60 minutes um, uh, uh, piece that was done in 2003 where they interviewed Peter Daszak and he's saying the next epidemic is going to be coming from here because these coronaviruses that are coming out of these bats, for whatever reason, they have this ability to jump from, from in this case, bats to other hosts. And that can, and because of the wildlife trade that happens in that part of the world, we see that there, this, is, um, this elevates the risk. Um, that's not to say, of course, that these kinds of risks are not found in other places in the world too, right? So I don't mean to, to necessarily you know, say that Wuhan is the only source for any of these zoonotic diseases. But in this case, this is where it's coming from. Great. Thank you so much, Albert. Um, this is a really great sort of a segue into what Rod's going to talk about. But I also want to remind our viewers um, that uh, you can also leave questions in French. So, vous pouvez laisser votre question en français aussi, um, and they will be sent to me as well. So, please feel free to use um, English and French if you have any questions at all. So, Rod, you're going to talk a little bit. You're, it's a great segue for you because you've got some really interesting information about. Um, places around the world and um, and some of the risks that are out there in terms of this virus. Um, but as well, I just want to remind our viewers, um, Rod has some really amazing information, but there are also um, some images on there that may be disturbing to some viewers. So just be aware of that as he goes on to speak. So Rod, go ahead. Hi, everyone. So uh the intricate relationship between animals and people and the environment. That's really what we're talking about today when it comes to a disease like COVID-19. And I've had the opportunity to uh, work with many species of animals over the last uh, 40 years. And uh, I've also had the uh, opportunity to work with uh, animals in many parts of the world. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, animal welfare. So what, what is animal welfare is an important question. We don't have a universal accepted definition, but uh, I was co-author of a book that was just published at the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. It's called The Animal Welfare Guide for Veterinarians, and it's out in quite a few different languages. So animal welfare is the physical, psychological, social, and environmental well-being of animals. Because animals are sentient beings and can suffer and feel pain, welfare needs to include feelings. Next slide, please. So WHO, the World Health Organization, defines zoonotic disease as diseases that are transmissible between animals and people. These examples include COVID-19, SARS, HIV, influenza, rabies, Ebola, the list goes on. And according to the CDC, 75% of 
of emerging infectious disease are animal-related disease and zoonotic. Uh, we'll skip the next slide. Thank you. So the World Organization for Animal Health, which is sort of the, the world standard, has stated that we need global strategies to prevent and control pathogens that can become zoonotic if we are to protect public health. These should be coordinated at the human-animal ecosystem interface and applied at the national, regional, and global level through the implementation of appropriate policies. So uh, that captures the idea that we have to really look at the beginning of where pandemics arise. Next slide, please. So when we look at our relationship with animals, is it positive or negative? Is it good or bad? Well, it is a very complex relationship and a very long one. You can see cavemen drawings of animals at the beginning of time. And some parts of this relationship are negative, emerging disease, infectious disease, trauma from aggressive animals. But if you start looking at the good side of the equation, it is by far the largest side. The next slide, please. So we have a list here of things that are positive with the animals that we cohabit. And if a person that owns a dog touches their dog, their blood pressure actually decreases. So there's a number of medical benefits that we receive from our interaction with animals. And not to mention pet therapy, dog sniffers at airports, finding deep gas leaks, finding people buried under the snow or after an earthquake. The positive side of the balance far outweighs the negative. Dogs alert us to people with cancer, diabetes, and recently dogs are picking out people that have early stages of COVID-19. I have no doubt this is going to be one of the best tests that we have available. So I just wanted to talk about why pandemics arise. We know our health is very related to the health of animals and the environment. So let's look at a few slides that will point out how the mistreatment of animals and the environment can start human uh, pandemics. Next slide, please. Here we see a picture of logging in the Congo. This often results in clear cutting. And this is really important to the world when we start getting clear cutting of places like Brazil and South Africa and Central Africa. It gives people a, a, a way to get into remote territories and get exposed to a lot of wild animals that they never would have come into contact with. Next slide, please. So I don't mean to show disturbing pictures, but this is what typically happens in the South Africa, Central Africa. Uh, Bushmeat is extremely popular and illegal in most cases, but they're consumed by people. And people bring in live animals, put them in cages in close proximity. They're butchered in the, the uh, area. And so you get a mix of blood, body fluids, people, and animals. Animals are stressed, they're treated inhumanely, and they are very susceptible to infectious disease. It's a great place for viruses to grow and mutate. Next slide, please. So this is a market in uh, Asia. And like the bushmeat situation, we have a mix of animals treated inhumanely, susceptible to disease, put into a proximity of uh, catching the virus or bacteria that are there. And this is where diseases like COVID-19 and SARS uh, emanated from. Once these diseases, like Albrecht stated, uh, transfer from human to human, a pandemic is not very far away. Uh, next slide, please. So we also have our issues in North America. We have very intensive farming that goes on in North America and different parts of Europe. 
especially in poultry, veal, calves, swine. And in these situations, animals are stressed, put together in close proximity, and it's a great place for diseases like influenza to start. And we have people working in those environments. And so again, it's a question of uh, animals uh, being too stressed and very susceptible to disease. The other thing that happens in intensive agriculture is that we overuse antibiotics. And when we do that, because we're trying to prevent disease in these stressed animals, we have an overuse of antibiotics. And right now we are starting to see diseases that people get that are resistant to antibiotics. And uh, this, I think, is going to become more important than viral pandemics. Uh, next slide, please. So we have to learn to be kind to the environment and decrease pollution, and we have to treat animals humanely. For the past 20 years, I've volunteered in many parts of the world, uh, many poor parts of the world, with spay, neuter, vaccination clinics, trying to improve animal welfare. The world is a small place, and countries need to work together to resolve, resolve environmental issues. One of the things that we're seeing today is that we're not working together. It seems to be going in the opposite direction. Next slide, please. This is at a clinic that I was at in uh, South Africa, Johannesburg. And people there, like many other communities I've been to, uh, are very poor. And you can see their pets are carried with them. They are very important to their family. And the human animal bond is extremely powerful in a lot of poor communities. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to mention is that way back, Gandhi has stated, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way our animals are treated. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you so much, Rod. That's excellent. Um, Albrecht, I'll get you to come um, back on again. And this is a really kind of interesting discussion that, and some great questions that are coming in as well. Um, and one of the questions that I think is probably on most people's minds is, um, is why, why is it that we need to either wait for a vaccine? Why isn't there um, an antiviral medication or a, um, a you know, antibiotic, but some, some kind of medication that we can, can't quickly develop or quick, more quickly develop than a vaccine for COVID? And, you know, how does those, how do those viruses, how do those viruses, you know, work that, like work or not work that way? Yeah, so I'm not a virologist. <clears throat> so um, I can only explain what I understand from some of my reading. But, um, you know, these are novel viruses. Um, these are not, uh, you know, SARS, which, uh, you know, for those of us here in Canada, we remember what SARS was like in Toronto um, back in 2003, I think it was. Um, you know, you can't use antibiotics to treat viruses, right? Antibiotics are for bacteria. Um, viruses, you know, we don't have, the, you know, some of the tools we have is, um, they include, you know, these antivirals, but there's not very many of them actually. And, um, you know, like uh, the, the vaccine is actually, as a, as a tool in the toolkit to fighting viruses, is, is the most effective one. Um, this is, like I said, this is a novel virus. I know that there are people, even at Laurentian, that are participating in ways to develop drugs that will interfere. You know, I don't know if you remember, but when I explained about how viruses sort of hijack um, the cell sort of apparatus, when they have to like sort of uh, bind to the surface of the cell, um, there are drugs that they're trying to develop that will interfere with that. So to prevent the virus from actually using those spikes to actually um, attach themselves to that cell receptor that allows them to enter into the cell. And, and so that's where a lot of the drug um, development is in terms of um, therapeutics and stuff like this. But I mean, you know, viruses are, are tricky beasts. And I don't think that it's very easy to find sort of, you know, a medicine that's going to, to easily um, um, cure it, if you will. 
they certainly, you know, this virus seems to do a lot of crazy things to the body. And there's lots of, and there's stuff about the, it seems that the, the body's uh, immune system also kind of goes haywire when it tries to fight off this virus. So that's another complication that's associated with it. And coronavirus isn't a new type of virus. Corona, there are different types of coronavirus yeah, around. For sure. yeah. um, and, and so one of the, one of the questions I think maybe for you, Albert too, is when somebody's asking like, how did the COVID virus actually get to China and maybe give us a little bit of a background of how viruses, um, you know, form or evolve or, you know, where, yeah. where they sort of originate. So, I mean, again, I'm not a virologist, but um, I am an evolutionary biologist and we know like viruses, you know, they sort of are interesting because they're not really alive. They're not, they're, they're not really dead. Right. They, they're, they, they kind of are this interesting beast, but the, the viruses themselves, I mean, you know, um, they've been around since, <laughs> since forever, right? Like uh, animals and living things have been dealing with viruses since for billions of years. These are, these are self-replicating pieces of DNA that, that um, parasitize living cells. And um, so, you know, we're living with viruses all the time. Viruses are part of our genome, you know? Like we, if you look and, and sequence the human or any animal genome, you'll find pieces of DNA that are derived from viruses. Um, so they're a very ancient uh, form, and I, I won't call them of life, but they're certainly an ancient sort of, you know, structure that we've been dealing with in a whole variety of different contexts. Um, coronaviruses, you're right, there, there are coronaviruses around here. The common cold is a coronavirus. Um, so, you know, I mean, one interesting thing is, to, is asking the question, you know, is this virus, how is it going to evolve? Right. So, you know, there's some theories about there are there is a theory about uh, pathogen evolution and what happens when pathogens, um, you know, how does their virulence change over time? And we can make predictions about what we might expect. Um, certainly what's interesting is that viruses that um, evolve in places like sort of, you know, like some of these um, these uh, markets where they housed animals in tight proximity or in agriculture, you know, when, when they put livestock in tight proximity, usually a pathogen or a parasite should not kill their host because that should be not in its best interest, right? Because if I get infected by the virus and it kills me right away, then that means the virus has not been transmitted to the next host. Um, but what's interesting is that when you have viruses that evolve in these situations where they've got lots of different hosts in close proximity, that that um, they can transmit themselves fairly easily from one host to the other. And therefore, there's not selection against, um, against virulence. And so they are more likely to be um, lethal or at least have a, you know, a really negative impact on the host's health when they evolve in these kinds of contexts. But moving forward, how does the virus evolve when we are putting all these distancing measures? and we're, you know, So that's, that's an interesting thing that I have that I thought about, you know, what's going to happen with this virus. And, and veterinarians, you know, uh, for a lot of years now, probably 100 years, have been dealing with coronaviruses in different species. Yeah. Cats get their own coronavirus, dogs get theirs, pigs get theirs, uh, generally stays within uh, the species. But, you know, in, in just getting back to the development of vaccines and treatments, we've been, how long did it take for getting an effective treatment for AIDS? Uh, HIV, uh, we still don't really have a vaccine for it. Uh, same with Ebola, SARS. It takes many years to develop a vaccine. And in some of the cases you have to, in most cases of vaccine, you have to deal with animals first to try and see if it works in that animal species and then you try it in people. Many animals don't have receptors uh, to like people do. They have a uh, a different kind of receptor network. And so you have to use specific animals that are very susceptible to uh, COVID-19. For example, ferrets, hamsters, uh, cats as well are susceptible to uh, COVID-19. So um, Rod, one of the, some of the questions that are coming in, I think people are quite concerned with their um, they're sort of the, with the animals around us. So is there a risk at all of whether it's COVID or whether it's any other kind of zoonotic um, at all? So any other virus that could be transmitted um, to humans from concern about animals around North America? Is there a concern with our pets at home 
what other things are well, out there? You know, with uh, people getting disease, as I mentioned in my talk, 75% of our diseases are zoonotic. So, yes, there is a, a very large relationship between animals and people. That's why we have to have healthy animals and a healthy environment. Otherwise, people cannot be healthy. In terms of COVID, uh, you know, cats are, are found to be positive with COVID, and they seem to be susceptible to getting COVID. And they found that in the Netherlands and Hong Kong and different parts of the world. Uh, there were some big cats in a zoo that were positive in the U.S. Uh, so the feline species is susceptible, and we're finding people that have COVID if you test their animals, their pets, they could be positive. Dogs less so, but dogs can act like a, a fomite or inanimate object. If a person has COVID and they pet their dog, uh, their dog could be for a short term contagious if someone else pets the dog. So, but that's sort of a, an outlier. And, but we do know that cats and dogs do not give COVID to people. So it doesn't go the other way around. It just goes in one direction. And so if you have COVID, uh, you need to be careful when you're handling your pets. And is there, is there any, are there any types, I'm sort of wondering about, are there any types of viruses that could come, you know, we've talked about a lot of these viruses coming out of Asia as an example, but are there viruses like that that could be, you know, come out of North America or other parts of the world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, influenza is a huge virus that undergoes change, mutation sure. every year. And that's why our vaccines, again, there don't always work effectively, depending on the strain of influenza. But that virus tends to emanate from poultry, swine, other animals. Uh, when uh, I was working a lot with wildlife, I was trying to get the government to uh, take a look at testing uh, wild birds, because wild birds are uh, one of the factors in uh, causing influenza. It's one of the things that uh, causes hundreds of thousands of poultry farms, uh, poultry to be euthanized uh, just this year, for example, in the U.S., because they have, uh, they, they got influenza. It's so contagious that really what you have to do is euthanize all of those birds. And some of these farms have 100, 200,000 birds on the farm. So it's a welfare issue just in the euthanasia. How do you euthanize that many birds in a short period of time in a humane way? It's just about impossible. So we have disease lurking around. But if we do things that are not humane for animals, what we're doing is increasing the number of diseases that we're seeing in the environment and are there uh, if i could just add quickly oh, go ahead Albert. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. okay yeah sorry oh. um you brought up the point about um other viruses i mean the, the one thing is that these viruses can jump out of any uh, situation in which we have um, dense you know uh, animals uh, living in proximity to humans so just the 2009 h1n1 uh, swine flu epidemic started in mexico um so this is this is the kind of thing that it starts in like it started in a swine farm in a, in a remote region of Mexico. So you know these things are not unique to to certainly not to China. And there are things that you know there are situations that we need to be very mindful of. And of course there are welfare issues associated with it, of course. But um, it's it's this 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 dense um, aggregation of animals, uh, particularly livestock or even you know particularly wildlife, uh, being brought and then. Um, and then having that sort of in close proximity to humans, that's where we, we see these the, the risks elevated for the transition of these zoonotic diseases into humans. And then are either of you aware of any rules or regulations that governments around the world, whether it's the Canadian government or otherwise, that maybe that they're considering to help reduce these risks or some things that we might want to consider as governments to reduce these risks, especially when we think of um, the type of farming that we, you, yeah. you know, the farming that we, we have currently and things like that? Well, some of the wet markets in Asia, uh, some of the animals that they've been using are illegal and have been, but they haven't been uh, closely monitored. And so now 
I've heard that in different Asian countries, they're really starting to uh, look closely at that. There's a lot of uh, dogs that are uh, consumed for meat in different countries in the world. And uh, that is becoming illegal in most countries that I'm aware of. Uh, some of the intensive agriculture that we have, uh, I belong to an animal welfare committee in the U.S. And uh, so, you know, they're slowly making inroads and change in intensive agriculture, but it's a very complex situation. People don't want to spend more for their eggs and their chicken and their pork. So what you're left with is a very, uh, not an ideal way of, of farming. So, and then there's feeding the whole world. Uh, how do you do that and cut down on the amount of farming and agriculture? So it's, it's a difficult concept, but in terms of uh, bushmeat, in terms of uh, wet markets, they are changing and I think they're gonna be changing drastically. So that's great news. It might be worthwhile for us to actually describe what a wet market is and what bushmeat is. I mean, just so that people understand that. So a wet market is a place where uh, wildlife often are brought into a concentrated area, you know, like a market and where they are slaughtered there, right? And bushmeat is the, the trade of bushmeat is, is wildlife, like bringing wildlife and bringing them into the market. And that, and that meat is called bushmeat. And um, it's uh, mostly associated, we think about bushmeat in terms of uh, what happens in Africa, but, and the wet markets, of course, you know, that's the term that we've seen associated with Asia. And with bushmeat, I mean, that's where we got uh, HIV and yeah. Ebola, Ebola. Yeah. Uh, yeah. by eating uh, yeah. mostly the uh, monkey chimpanzee yeah. populations. So it's the butchering of these animals that you get a bloodborne disease. I mean, this yeah. kind of thing, you know, these concerns are associated with anybody who hunts, right? Like, I mean, I think there have been advisories for, you know, hunters here in Canada when they're butchering meat, you have to be very careful because you've got, you know, parasites, pathogens that can jump from the animals that you're that you're butchering to you. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily lead to a human to human transmission, right? Which is what it led to the yeah. pandemic. The one thing I just want to note is that, I mean, there's no doubt that agricultural, um, you know, ministries and, and government officials are aware of these, these risks that we've talked about, right? So in, in many agricultural contexts, you know, there is strict controls in terms of, you know, uh, people entering into barns and stuff like this. And again, Rod would know more than I, but that's my understanding anyway, is that there are, um, you know, a, there is awareness that, that, you know, keeping animals in these kinds of contexts can lead to transmission of disease. Yeah, and welfare of animals is pretty new concept. Uh, it's only been around for really 20, 25 years. Uh, UK was ahead of North America. But really, it's not an area that we've really focused on. And it's becoming more so, and it really needs to be, because I think some, in some cases, society really wasn't aware of that relationship. Um, I'm really... I'm really interested as well. This is um, this has been a kind of a, an interesting question. We've talked a lot about um, through some of the panels that we've talked here at Science North about um, about the the influence that you know this shutdown, um, the isolation has had on human health. And I'm wondering, um, Rod, if you could talk a little bit about the well-being of animals within our community, so our pets and things like that. Um, you know, has you know, has the incidence of lost pets increased? Have of uh, you know different types of pet owners, whether it's agricultural or um, home pets, have they faced particular challenges during this time? Um, especially with veterinarians being close to regular care, except for emergency care. What have you been hearing within your community? Well, I think in in a lot of cases, pets are thinking this is a golden period. Uh, <laughs> everybody's at home. Uh, and there seems to be a really good positive relationship with people uh, teleworking, working at home. If they have pets, they seem to be doing a lot better than if they're uh, alone without pets. And so I think it's a really good symbiotic relationship. And pets are experiencing some really good things. However, we always have to be mindful if we have a disease outbreak in a society sometimes society has a knee-jerk reaction. If there's a rabies situation in India, uh, they may poison uh, uh, pets in that area because they're afraid of rabies. 
instead they could have just vaccinated for rabies and resolved the issue. So we have to be careful of uh, societal reactions, you know, in different countries in Europe, uh, in the far north in Canada. Uh, we've been guilty of having shooting days because there's an overpopulation of dogs and they're trying to resolve the problem by getting rid of the population. Does not solve the problem. You have to spay, neuter and do other things. But so we have to be careful because there have been cases of animals being poisoned even when it started showing that some cats could be susceptible to COVID. People right away formed the opinion that, you know, you got to be afraid of feral cats or cats coming into my yard. So uh, people need to be aware of how those things work and what they do. But I think all in all, it's a golden period for pets. I think they love having everybody at home. I know my dog does. She loves yeah at home. <laughs> um, we have some questions coming in about sort of the relationship between um, some of the things that we've seen around the world, but also things that are happening here in Canada. So, so you know, we had a question about, um, you know, hunting in Canada, what are risks associated with um, how we secure food through hunting within our region. And we also had a question about are there not wet markets in Canada as well? Not truly a wet market, because a wet market the reason it's called wet is because there's body fluids of the animals that are butchered on the floor. And so they're, they get wet and it's a really a very contaminated area. So we generally don't have situations like that in Canada. We have markets and uh, you know, a lot of vegetables and some meats and some fish and so on, but it's not at the same state as for example, the countries in different parts of Asia. But, uh, you know, and hunting has some issues. I mean, uh, hunters can pick up a disease from rabbits uh, by butchering them. They can pick up disease from deer mice, hantavirus. They can pick up, uh, you know, there's been different diseases that large ruminants have had in Canada that are uh, found in people as well. So I think, you know, People need to be careful when they're hunting. I think all in all, we're pretty fortunate in North America. Uh, but in some cases, hunters become pretty uh, adept uh, when they're butchering an animal, looking and noticing that there's something wrong with this liver or this lung. And they have to be careful about eating some of these because there could be something they would pick up. So I think uh, you have to be careful. It's like getting livestock butchered. Uh, most of that meat is inspected by veterinarians and uh, if looking like it could be contaminated is not used. We still have things that slip through whether it's vegetables or people uh, but uh, I think mostly we're pretty fortunate in North America. So because we uh, have some insiders here from Laurentian University. Is there anyone at Laurentian or maybe at other universities across Canada or research centers that we know of who is um, looking to study the impact of COVID-19 on our animal populations um, in and around? Do you, does anybody know any interesting Yeah, stuff? I think, um, so yeah, I can speak to that just briefly. I think uh, one of the concerns that uh, we've had, so um, is the possibility that this, um, virus could find a natural reservoir, wildlife reservoir in North America, right? So we know that it can be transmitted to other species. So, you know, Rod mentioned um, ferrets. So we do know that it goes into mink and um, that is that, that mink can carry it. And uh, there's evidence that, you know, a mink farm could, um, if you had a, a, an infected mink farmer, that the, a mink farm itself could, uh, the mink on there could be, um, could become infected. Uh, we know, for example, that those mink can also escape into the wild and interbreed with wild mink. And so there is the possibility that you could end up with uh, a wild natural reservoir of coronavirus or COVID-19 here. Um, and I think that that's something that does concern people. And so I've been doing some work with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and, and that's, you know, we're discussing this, trying to come up with a way to see if we could monitor some wildlife, like figure out how to monitor different wildlife populations for the presence of potentially this, this, um, this pathogen. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in Canada, we're actually doing a lot of work uh, 
you need a level three or four lab to work out of because of the infectious issue with COVID. Uh, and you have to be working with a certain animal, but we are developing vaccines and uh, some treatments. And so I think, uh, you know, it's a couple of the veterinary colleges in Canada, they've been doing a lot of work and uh, we have a, an accurate test now for uh, testing pets for COVID. And so there's been a really active uh, scene uh, testing pets that are in positive households. Uh, I was hoping to get somebody in Sudbury to do that, but uh, we don't have a lot of positive households, so we don't have the numbers needed to really do something scientific. We've been very fortunate to have our infection rates pretty low here in Sudbury and in Northern Ontario, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> comparatively. <laughs> comparatively. Um, Dr. Eager uh, wants me to ask you, Albrecht, if you could tell us a little bit more about the research your team's doing to understand um, the urban influence on animal welfare. Uh, well, yeah, I saw that. I, I, I don't, um, I mean, my research group doesn't really address the welfare issues per se. Um, we're interested in, and actually it does, uh, it has come to bear in terms of disease, but we're interested in the effects of um, sort of uh, anthropogenic or human food waste and how that affects uh, wildlife that are living in in um, in cities, and so you know we've done a little bit of work on raccoons and found that raccoons that are living in areas where they have access to to garbage, um, they tend to have uh, both. They tend to be heavier, clearly, uh, but they also tend to have elevated um, blood blood glucose proteins, um, indicating that they have elevated blood sugar levels. Um, so we're, we're doing some work associated with that. But what is actually, and it, to sort of segue back to, into this disease aspect of things, the thing is that there are species that live at high densities in urban areas. And um, if those species end up becoming a reservoir for something like COVID-19, that has some serious, um, you know, uh, there's some consequences associated with that. Um, and so it would be interesting actually to know whether raccoons can, can harbor the virus for example, and, and when you have places where there's, you know, a lot of uh, human food waste, you know, I just think of like garbage cans and things like this, you can have an aggregation of animals and the transmission of disease then can happen more quickly and more easily. And, um, and so, you know, there's, that's something to think about. You can look at uh, Southern Ontario, for example, in Hamilton, we've had a very high incidence of rabies in raccoons and we have a high incidence of raccoon populations. So whenever, there's a high population in an area, it seems that one of the diseases that hits in North America is rabies. And we've seen that with fox population and now the raccoon population. And, you know, we're pretty fortunate here in people not getting rabies and dying. But for example, in parts of South Africa and India, uh, thousands of people have died with rabies. So it is another one of those uh, zoonotic uh, viruses. Absolutely. There is always all kinds of things to to tack about this. Um, we have one. We have one more really great question coming in. Um, maybe Rod, can you tell us about um, some of the early research that's been going on that's been showing that dogs might be able to actually detect people that have COVID nineteen? Yeah. Well, dogs are amazing. Their sense of smell, we can't even begin to relate how they pick up odors. When a dog walks into a room, he just does not just smell a good dinner coming up. He knows what happened a half an hour ago, uh, even if that thing is not there anymore because of the different odors in the room. So when they walk into a room, there's a whole story that they're aware of. Their sense of smell is just amazing. And so, I, I know of people that have diabetes and they have a diabetic detection dog. When their blood sugar is too high, their dog will wake them up. Uh, how does a dog do that? I have no idea, but they have an odor. Uh, people that have uh, uh, cancer, different types of cancer. There are cats that know when a person is going to pass away at night and they go and share the bed with them. In a, in a nursing home, uh, you know, dogs are just, you know, and a dog, 
just imagine being able to sniff out 200 people at an airport or 200 suitcases looking for COVID. I mean, that, how many, you know, that, that's an amazing process that you can see with dogs. Uh, a COVID test can't test like that. Dogs can detect uh, an oil leak that's 10 feet underground. Uh, so their sense of smell has really prompted uh, scientists and researchers to utilize them. I think that, it, you know, it would be interesting. Um, you can, it, this is a respiratory disease that attacks the respiratory system. So you're breathing in and out, you know, particles. And yeah. so it's not that big of a stretch to imagine that uh, if you had, you know, uh, an infection, uh, that it would give off, you know, some chemical signal that could be picked up by an animal like a dog that had a very, you know, very uh, acute sense of smell, right? Because yeah. you're, you're breathing out, you know, stuff yeah. that they would be able to, to, to detect. But the, the amazing thing is they're able to detect from touch, not just respiratory uh, debris. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a new science but it looks like it's going to have tremendous possibilities. That's really neat. We had, we just had a comment come in um, from Olivia and she is a primatologist who's working in Brazil um, and in uh, the, uh, with an endangered primate species. And we've been talking a lot about how <laughs> viruses can be transmitted to humans, but back and forth, viruses from humans can also be transmitted back into the wildlife population. She mm -hmm. had to stop her field research data um, because so that they wouldn't spread the virus to the threatened species that she was studying. So maybe somebody touched little bit about that of how it can go also go back and forth well the research community uh has been like totally blown apart by this COVID-19 crisis um at least those people doing field work for a number of reasons one of them is what you've just alluded to the, the potential if you're working on primates or other species that could get the virus then yes you I mean clearly curtailing uh field work is important I mean any 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 time you can't do any physical distancing even like you know um we're very concerned about our teams going out into the field and, and, and getting the virus from each other, for example. We're worried about transmitting the virus to potentially, you know, like you've mentioned, like you know, endangered primates, which would be a disaster. Um, there's concerns about people doing field work in remote communities, right? Bringing the virus with them to those communities, uh, particularly indigenous communities up in the Arctic. Um, it is, uh, this has been, this has blown apart um, field research for so many people, not just um, biologists, but geologists, anyone who's doing work in the field um, in, in, uh, in groups. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, for my own work, I, you know, I don't think we're too concerned about transmitting the virus to the kinds of animals that I work on, but I mean, I can totally sympathize with someone who's concerned about with that kind of concern because I mean, that's, it's, it's, I mean, like everything else in the world, you know, it's a global pandemic affecting every single person. Uh, this is uh, really affecting those of us that do field research um, really in, in a very profound way. And in some of the uh, mink farms in the Netherlands, uh, they've had quite a few positives of COVID uh, getting, they, they get COVID from workers on those farms. And so what they've actually done, because they don't know truly the extent of, can you get it from mink, for example? or mink passing it to other mink, or mink passing it to wild mink. Uh, so they have actually quarantined farms and don't allow anybody within 400 yards of these farms just because there's a lot of things they don't really understand yet. So I think there's, you know, there's things that we're going to learn and, and see over the next year or two that uh, maybe would be a surprise for us. Absolutely. We're going to begin wrapping things up today. Um, Rod, is there anything else that you wanted to add to the conversation to finish us off? Well, my, my, uh, uh, the thing that I really focus on is animal welfare. It's near and dear to me. Uh, and whatever I do with animals incorporates welfare. And so it's really important that people understand what animal welfare is and to take note of it because we're not going to resolve any of the pandemic issues that we're seeing or antibiotic resistance until 
we really take note of animal welfare and start doing the right thing on behalf of animals. Thank you. And Albrecht, is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up? Yeah, yeah. I would like to say that, you know, I would like people to understand and realize that many of the diseases, many of the pathogens that affect us are zoonotic in nature. That is, they are coming from animals. And we need to, as a society, really commit to monitoring wildlife uh, in these areas. We need to um, commit to investing in our public health systems. All of these systems are generally underappreciated until we run into a situation like what we're dealing with now. Um, we've had all kinds of different, um, uh, you know, times in which a pandemic could have happened. So I think of SARS, I think of H1N1, you know, and, and you know, thanks to the work of, of uh, public health officials, we have, you know, we've been able to prevent something like this. But what we've got now is a, a virus that has a transmission rate that is fairly high. Um, it has, you know, um, a, a, a high virulence, that is that people get very sick or they die. And we really need to understand that this is, you know, this can happen again. And we really need to, as a society, value what uh, we're doing in terms of public health, what we value in terms of, we have to value what's happening in terms of research and understanding where these viruses are coming from so that we can prevent them from happening. And, and just, just a quick word on public health. I think public health needs to incorporate veterinarians and biologists on their scope because of the interrelationship between animals, people, and the environment. That's where the world is heading and public health needs to take note of that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm gonna bring back on Dr. Tammy Eager to wrap us up for today. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rod and Albrecht. This was really, truly a uh, uh, really inspiring uh, to hear this work that uh, you're doing and also your passion. And, and I think what it really showed us today is the importance of evidence-based research, the importance of science communication. And I think the three of you here clearly showed that uh, if we bring researchers together and we understand uh, the, uh, the problem and we can communicate that well, we can all then be part of the solution. So thank you to all of you. Uh, cet événement est un excellent exemple de collaboration en l'Université Laurentienne et Science North. Uh, je voudrais prendre quelques minutes pour remercier les personnes qui ont travaillé très fort pour rendre cet event possible. We are very fortunate to have partnered with Science North to bring the seminar series uh, today to everyone who have joined us, uh, I think from not just the Sudbury region, but from around the world. And particularly, I wanted to thank uh, Julie Muscolic, who's the science director uh, with Science North, and uh, Julie Ailick and Renata Brandt, and also Amy uh, here, who's with us. All of these individuals from Science North uh, were key in bringing the seminar series together. And at Laurentian University, our teams from communication and marketing, and particularly uh, Jillian Schultz, who's the Director of Strategic Research Initiatives, who's been leading this, uh, this uh, seminar series for Laurentian. And of course, again, our two speakers, uh, Albrecht and Rod, who uh, kicked us off today with, I think, uh, just an exceptional uh, first series. And just reminder to everyone, we are gonna be doing this for the next five weeks. And uh, we'll be joined with uh, different speakers, I think we may have some different facilitators uh, that will be joining us as well. We'll see some different blue coats. This is exciting. And so our next event is May 27th, uh, again, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we will be talking or learning about COVID-19 and the impact on housing, homelessness, and vulnerable groups. Amy, any final words? No, we are just so excited to be talking about this with and partnering with Laurentian University. So on behalf of Science North, thank you very much for coming on board. And uh, we are very excited about the rest of these next talks that we're going to have over the next few weeks. So I can't wait. Thank you, everyone. And final thank you to the audience, everyone who joined us from around the region. Uh, be safe, everyone. Be well. And remember social or physical distancing. Wash your hands. And uh, as uh, Rod said, if you have pets, remember to give them, uh, give them some love. They help to keep us uh, healthy when we keep them well. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Amy. Take care, everyone. Bye, Bye. Amy.
Thank you, everyone. That was awesome. Oh, it was good. It was yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Rodden. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank yes. you. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very well. So I think we've Rod and uh, Albert have signed off, but we'll yeah. certainly I'll send them a note of thanks. Yes. Uh, and thanks uh, for all the behind the scenes moving of the 